All right, so we're going to go through the documentary E equals MC squared. And we're going to go piece by piece. So I've divided it into sections. Um, in the video, the first section was on energy, right? And one of the main people that comes up in this is uh, Michael Faraday. So I wrote some questions, right? Here's the first question. Um, and by the way, you know, here's, you know, when he was um, born 19, in 1791, died 1867. So he lived a fairly long life, well, 76 years, not bad. Um, so what was his educational training? Does anyone remember? Or his background and or his background. Just jump in if you, if you know. Anyone uh, remember from the video? Actually, we could say he had none. No formal training. Uh, if you remember, he was actually poor. And I think the video mentions that son of a blacksmith. Sounds like an insult. Son of a, more like a swear word. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, he had no formal training. So basically, he had to learn on his own. And he didn't have the internet, so keep that in mind. He could just basically uh, actually grab a book from the library, do some research. He visited many lectures. Obviously, he saw Davy, and that's how he got connected to Davy. So, um, uh, you know, so he had no formal training. Davy obviously did. He was a, obviously in a different class altogether. Um, how did Davy treat him? Do you remember? Davy did not treat him Oh, something in the chat. Yeah, so it says here that uh, that he betrayed Faraday, and I think he accused him of stealing in um, research and plagiarizing, and so he was not treated very well. In fact, there's um, I don't know if he. Apparently he said this, but I'm not really sure. He said that uh, he joked that um, his assistant, which is Faraday, was actually his greatest uh, discovery. I don't know if he was being sarcastic. Probably not very really sure. I was looking up a little bit about the history between these two, and it seemed like, um, yeah, he wasn't treated very well. There was a story where they were supposed to go somewhere, and his wife, you know, um, made sure that Faraday did not eat with them, that they that he ate with the servants. So he was treated like as if he was not a gentleman, like in a different uh, class altogether. So I would say, yeah, I would say on, probably not treated very well at all. So I would say in that case, the video is probably pretty accurate. Okay. Um, in the early 19th century, the scientists were investigating an uh, interesting phenomenon, phenomena. Uh, when a compass was placed near a wire conducting a current. We actually talked about this last year. So what was this um, phenomenon? Do you remember? Just jump in. If you don't have to, if you want to just, just jump in with the mic, turn your mic on and just, just jump in if you want to say anything. Uh, so it was a phenomenon, phenomenon discovered by Orsted? That yes, yeah. <laughs> What was that? A compass was deflected um, when it was near a wire that electricity ran through it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and that was very, very bizarre for the scientists at the time. So it was, yeah, you're right. Compass was deflected near a wire that, conduct, that was conducting electricity. Uh, if you remember, we talked about that last year. Now, yeah, that really like dumbfounded the scientists. They were like, what, what's going on here? And so Faraday comes up with this wild idea saying that he believed, so here's the idea, that there's probably some force that was coming uh, out of the wire. And that was causing the uh, compass needle to move. Now, the scientists... Well, you saw in the video, they were like, what? That's kind of weird. You know, forces coming out of a wire. You know, where did you learn that? We didn't learn that in university. And 
And so obviously it was considered a pretty, pretty radical uh, idea. What was, what was interesting is what he did after that. So here's another question, a follow-up question. Because basically, what, if you think about what happened, right? You take uh, a wire and you have a compass and you run a current through the wire. And what happens is the needle deflects, right? The needle moves. So it actually uh, moves in, in response to the current going through the wire. Now, he's thought about the opposite scenario. What if the magnet was, stat was static? So the magnet couldn't move, and we put uh, a wire that was conducting a current near that magnet. Well, what happened? And what he noticed was that the wire moved. And if you think about that, that's the actual exact opposite scenario, right? I mean, you can see the symmetry between these two ideas. One, you have uh, a wire conducting current and the magnet moves. And the other, you have the magnet is stationary and then you put a wire conducting current near it and the wire moves. You can see how the, those two are symmetrical. So um, when the wire moved, it proved that Faraday's idea was correct. And what he did was he actually created the what? The first what? Created the first, oh yeah, someone's gonna say it. Oh, yeah. Electric motor. Yeah, very good. First electric motor. For some reason, every time I click on chat, it doesn't come up. I have to double click it, triple click it. I'm not really sure. Yeah, so you created the first electric motor, right? And you remember that from the, uh, the video club. Okay, all right. So, you know, the video goes on and then it talk about Einstein. So, Einstein born in 1979, died in 1955. Okay, so my question is. How would you describe him as a student? Emma, how would you describe him as a student? I don't know. What do you mean? Did you watch the video? I did. I don't know. You like did he... not watch the video. You watched the Captain did. America videos again, weren't you? Okay, so anyway, um, I guess he was kind of like, I don't know, he didn't really go to his classes and so I don't know, like a bad student. I don't know, but he was really smart. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It seemed like if if it wasn't material that he wanted to study, he didn't care about it, right? Seemed to me, to me, it seemed like a bit of a pain in the butt. I don't know. I think he'd be the type of student that would drive me crazy. I know, uh, you know, you guys are really nice. When I make mistakes, you're very, very polite and saying, "Sir, I think your mistake is you should take that calculation." I don't think. I think Einstein would just rip me a new one. Uh, I think that's the type of student that he would he would be. <laughs> oh, he was, I should say, he was. Okay. Um, the video then goes on to talk about mass. All right. And they, they mention uh, the central figure in that section is Anton Lavoisier. Now, I think you probably remember him from chemistry because he's associated with the law of conservation of mass, right? So in the video, he talks about uh, an experiment that he does uh, to show that nature is a closed system. Uh, the experiment was, uh, do you remember what it was? He took water, converted it to steam, and then he ran the steam through a, a rifle barrel, okay? So, but it was made of iron. So he ran it through iron, basically, and hot iron, I should say. And what happened was he got less water. So he was missing water, right? What he noticed is that the mass of the iron barrel uh, increased. Uh, he also noticed that he got a, a combustible gas, but he called it combustible air because he didn't really know what it was, right? Uh, anyone want to guess what it was? Uh, 
What do you think? Think about uh, water. It was lighter than air and it was combustible. It was actually uh, hydrogen gas, right? Now, what he noticed was that the mass of these two things, that the increase in mass of the iron bale and the mass of the gas, mass was equal to the mass lost uh, when he was measuring the, the water, right? So the missing mass from the water, obviously, uh, you know, we could account for that as the iron barrels mass increased and the mass of the gas. So what that means then, what that meant to him is that no mass was lost. Right? So there's your uh, law of conservation uh, law of conservation of mass, if you remember that from grade 11, I think. Now, uh, what did he want to recreate? Do you remember? He actually wanted to recreate what? The, the water. That's what he wanted to recreate. He basically wanted to take the combustible air, which was hydrogen, and the vital, we call it the vital air, which is the, I guess we can say that's what contains the oxygen, right? And he wanted to recreate the water without losing a drop. That's what I think that's what he said. So that's what he wanted to recreate. Um, if you remember in the video, he seemed like not the nicest guy, probably not the guy you'd want to, you know, uh, go out for coffee with. Seems like a little, <laughs> a little bit arrogant. Um, what do you think led to his demise? Anybody remember? He was the head of tax enforcement oh, in Paris. Yes. Who likes tax collectors, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. So he was a, a, a hated tax collector. Uh, but the video also led you to believe that uh, he was also just hated in general. If you remember, I think it was the person who ordered his execution was the same person who went to him with an idea and he just shot it down. So maybe we can also say like his arrogance, uh, or just the fact that, you know, he was just despised, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that was also what did him in, but I would imagine that, you know, just being a tax collector would have been enough to get him, uh, the guillotine. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, the video then goes on to talk about after the section on mass, talk about C. All right. Remember what C stands for? It's a Latin term. It means um, celeritas, which means swiftness. All right. So C, that's where the C comes from. Um, okay. So in this section, again, we go back to Faraday. And he had an interesting idea about light. What did he think about the nature of light? Why did he have a hard time proving his idea? So remember, he unified electricity and magnetism, basically showing that they're the same thing. And then he thought about light. And he believed that light was actually just the same as electromagnetism. So he believed light was electromagnetism. Which again, was a wild idea. Problem is he didn't have the mathematical background to prove it. So the mathematical background was lacking to prove his idea. Well, along comes James Clerk Maxwell. Um, 
So I actually, you know, I, I was, so I looked up James a little bit. Uh, well, I found something really interesting. I didn't know, realize this, that he died very young. He was born 1831, died 1879. So he would have been only 48 years. He would have been younger than me when he died. And he died of abdominal cancer, just like his mother did. Actually, I don't know anyone who's had abdominal cancer. Uh, that, that to me was interesting. Because if you remember the video, he goes to visit uh, Faraday. And you see Faraday sitting in his chair. He's quite old. And he says to, he says to James, he says, uh, don't get old. Yeah, how ironic, right? Don't get old. Well, he didn't. He only you know, he died of, at the age of 48. So he goes to visit uh, Faraday, shows him a paper that he wrote. And in that paper, he mentions two really important things to Faraday. Uh, one has to do with the connection between electricity and magnetism. And the second was about the speed. So the first was, he uh, says to Faraday that uh, confirming what Faraday believed, was that uh, flowing electricity uh, generates magnetism. And then what he goes on to say is as that magnetic charge moves, it generates electricity. So you can see that these things are interwoven. I think that's the term that he uses, the interwoven. Now, what he says about this is that we call, if you want to call this a transformation of one becoming the other, right? This, uh, this transformation or conversion, if you like, uh, can only occur at C, the speed of light. So if, you, if you're curious, there is a, so this here, I looked this up. This is actually a book, a book published by James Clerk Maxwell in 1873. Uh, it's quite long. Um, a treatise on electricity and magnetism. I'm sure in the book he goes on to explain. I haven't looked at the book yet, but I'm sure he goes on to explain how he figured this out. So if you're curious, it is online. It's free. You can take a look at it. Uh, apparently, there are like 20 calculations that uh, he uses to show this. Uh, actually, I'm actually curious about this. So I actually started watching a video uh, about one of the calculations. This is very, very interesting, but I can see how uh, it's very, very difficult and how Faraday would have needed someone with like incredible mathematical skills to be able to, to work this out. So this confirmed you know, uh, that light is in fact electromagnetism because this only can occur at, at the speed of light, which is uh, C. All right. His calculations con con contained an incredible prediction. Does anyone know what that prediction was? What was the prediction? Yeah. You can never catch up to a beam of light. That's right. Thank you. Can never catch up to a beam of light. So if, uh, I think we talked about that with special relativity. So if you're traveling at 99% the speed of light, the beam, and you're trying to ca catch a beam of light, the beam of light will just simply move at you away from you at C, speed of light. Uh, you can never catch it. Now, Einstein, you get the impression from the video, Einstein loved Maxwell. And this idea that you can never catch up to a beam of light um, Einstein took as like this, you, you know, truth, pure truth. Can't, can't argue. He didn't doubt it at all. And if you remember, there's a scene 
where the his girlfriend, or was it a wife at the time? I think maybe it was his girlfriend at the time. Says, what if he's wrong? You know, Einstein didn't even say, oh yeah, maybe you're right. No, no, he, he firmly believed that Maxwell was correct. You can never catch up to a, a beam of light. Okay, so in this section of the video, we'll go all a little bit further in time. We see there's a clip where Einstein is um, watching a lady on a boat, looking at the water. Uh, what did he notice and what did he ponder? Okay. So this actually has to do with what we learned last year, relative motion. So what he noticed was that the ground observer, this person on the ground, uh, saw the wave move. So the boat's creating a wave, disturbance in the water, and the ground observer would see that wave move. However, the person on the boat, person on boat, sees the wave as stationary. Because the boat is moving at the same speed as the disturbance. So they would, they would see that wave as being uh, stationary. So he's looking at this and he pondered a question. What would it look like to travel at the speed of light? And then if you remember, he also goes on to, you know, to think about the, uh, the mirror question. Would he see himself in the mirror, right? So he got this idea from you know, thinking about regular, you know, uh, relative motion. And then he started thinking about well, what about light? Because if light is different, light can never catch up to a beam of light. What would it look like? Can't have static light. He mentions that in the video, right? You can't. Have, so the person looking at the disturbance in the water, that, that wave would be stationary to him. But he goes, you can't have static light. Because Maxwell said you can't have static light. So what would it look like? That would be very, very, very bizarre. The video get, then goes on to address, you know, it's called E equals MC squared, right? Uh, squared, things that are squared, right? And then in that section is Emily du Chatelet. Um, so you can see that she did also did not live very long. Uh, 40, did she get to? No, she didn't get to the age of 43. So just shy of 43. Um, what? What gave you the impression early on? Obviously, she's in the video. So this is does not exactly be someone who's uh, weak in science or math. Um, but what did they hint at in the beginning of the, that video clip that suggested that she was mathematically uh, brilliant? Does anyone remember? I think they mentioned that uh, she was able to divide large numbers in her head. Not really sure how big those numbers were, but I'm assuming if they mentioned in the video, that means these are things that normal people can't do. So that kind of suggested that she, you know, had a very, very strong mathematical uh, mind. Uh, what was unusual about her circumstance as a young woman? Anybody want to jump in here? What was unusual about her circumstance as a young woman? Thinking, thinking back to the fact that this is like the early 18th century, okay? It's like no, almost 300 years ago. Well, like not a lot of women were in science then. So yeah, she was yeah, kind of like yeah. on the outs. Yeah, it was very hard as a woman to to study uh, science, right? So she was able to do this. She was able to study science, which uh, was very unusual. Not only was she able to study science, she was also able to publish things that really you don't see until about 150 years later. So she was like 150 years ahead of her time, you know, 
towards the 1900. Uh, that's when you, you know, you start to see women studying science uh, and publishing. So she, you know, it was very, very unusual for her time. She was ahead of her time. Okay, now, uh, so in their video, they, um, if you remember, she was, uh, she trying to prove that um, Leibniz was correct in terms of how to calculate, obviously you knew they were talking about kinetic energy, right? So uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of Leibniz, maybe some of you have, but well, we've all heard of Newton, uh, but Leibniz is also another math, like giant in, in math, okay? And he, um, he believed that kinetic energy was a function of, of um, B squared. Whereas Newton believed it was just a function of, of V, the so mass times the speed, which you know now that would be uh, the momentum, right? So um, who did Emily believe was right? How did she prove it? Um, she believed that uh, Leibniz was right, and I don't. I remember. I don't really remember exactly what the experiment was, but it was something like when she dropped like a ball, it like went in the sand like further down or something like that. Yes, very good. So she dropped uh, lead balls into clay, and I think they were even uh, her lover Voltaire made a joke about it, so dropping lead balls into clay, and. Um, what she noticed was that if the speed doubled, so if you went, if the ball was dropped uh, at two times the speed, uh, then the distance was equal to four times, right? Which would be a function of, uh, you know, something squared, right? So if you double the speed, the distance that it travels through the clay would be four times more. Uh, so that was for Emily proof that uh, Leibniz uh, was correct. Um, what was interesting in the video is um, Voltaire Voltaire was the older guy. He's a little bit creepy because he looked a lot older than her, by the way. If you, if you saw the video, it's like, whoa, man, he looks so, like a lot older than Nana Lee. But anyways, um, he was against this whole idea. He was, uh, it seemed to suggest that uh, if Emily agreed with Leibniz, that she was agreeing to something called the occult, uh, which would be like an explanation of you're trying to explain something without really knowing what what's going on so more like kind of like like magic i guess or mysticism or maybe even a religious explanation and because um voltaire actually was an interesting character he actually um have you ever heard of voltaire maybe worth mentioning a little bit about voltaire and why he did not believe in Leibniz. So Voltaire actually is a main figure in the Enlightenment. This is when you have, you know, people turning to science to explain things as opposed to using religion as a way to explain things. Um, he, he has many very famous quotes. My favorite one is this one. Common sense is not so common. <laughs> he had some interesting ideas. He believed in things like uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion. He believed in the separation of church and state. Um, so I guess he might have had a personal issue with uh, Leibniz. Um, I guess he didn't watch the video of Newton's Dark Secret. Remember that video? <laughs> Newton's Dark Secret. 
uh, where I seem to suggest that Newton is, himself had some, uh, you know, some ideas that were kind of uh, wacky himself. Anyways, he was a very interesting character. Do you remember what he said about Emily's great fault? This is really interesting. What was her great fault or her greatest fault? That she was a woman. Yeah, <laughs> very good. That she was a woman. She, yeah, that was her greatest fault. Um, because if, I mean, you can tell that she was just like gifted, um, but uh, no, uh, in the end, her demise was that, uh, you know, she had a fourth child at the age of, I think it was, what did we say she was? Almost 43. So what led to her demise is uh, she died after her fourth child. Obviously, if she was a man, uh, this would not have happened to her. I'm assuming he also means that if she was a man, he he probably he she would have been taken more seriously. I'm assuming he meant that also, although you don't really know because the video doesn't really expand on that that quote. Um, anyways, and how long did it take for people to accept her ideas about uh, kinetic energy in that it is a function of uh, v squared? About a century, a hundred yeah. years. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. About a, a hundred years. It took a long time to accept that idea. Okay, back to Einstein. So, if you remember, when we went back to Einstein, they show him sitting in this patent office, the Bern Patent Office. Okay. Now, this question may seem very obvious. Why did he take a job at the Bern Patent Office? Well, obviously, he needed money, right? So that's true. Remember, he had a young family at the time. So he needed a source of revenue. Um, but there's something else interesting, too, about this specific job. Um, so according to sources that I've read, this specific job was... Uh, we can call it a mindless job. What that means, it was a type of thing that he could do without really thinking about it. So what that meant was that while he was working, he could think about physics. All right? I mean, think about a job where Imagine like even a simple job, like he had to record times, right? Like he would need to constantly think about that. Whereas the job that he was doing required him to not think that much. Maybe he was just stamping things. I have no idea what his exact job was. But a mindless job is a job where it doesn't require a lot of brain power. So he could, you know, sit in his office and think about physics and things that he really, really, really enjoyed. Okay, what was his great insight about? Sorry, life? Also, yeah. Also, like I guess in the video it was mentioned that because like he had a lot of um, problems with the professors, they wouldn't write him a letter, so he couldn't get any job in the academia. Yeah, that's true. I forgot that you're absolutely right. Yeah, he pissed off so many people. <laughs> he couldn't get a a real job. <laughs> Well, I shouldn't say real job. What I meant is uh, you couldn't get a job that was more uh, in line with his actual skills. You're right. He did, he did piss off a lot of people. Yeah. Very, thank you. Um, what was his great insight about light and time? So his great insight was that light was constant. but time was not. And he said that basically as things move faster, uh, 
time slows down. And we talked about that um, uh, before, okay? Uh, in 1905, it was a wild year for Einstein. He published five papers, okay? What were these papers? Well, the first one was on the uh, true nature of atoms. The second one was on the nature of light. We'll actually talk about that um, in quantum mechanics. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Um, he talked, uh, this third paper was on movement of molecules when heated. Basically, he was explaining uh, Brownian motion. And uh, this actually was the proof that atoms actually existed. The fourth was on special relativity. And the fifth one, B equals MC squared, which is what the video is about. Um, okay. The fifth paper, um, so there was a thought experiment that kind of um, went into, I, I, I'm assuming Einstein came up with that thought experiment, but I'm not really, I don't know if the video, were, did the video mention that he came up with the, the thought experiment about the train moving at the speed of light, or maybe someone that was someone else's thought experiment, but there was a thought experiment that kind of explained this concept of E equals MC squared. And it, would, it goes something like this, right? It goes, what would happen if you take a train uh, approaching the speed of light and you just kept pumping, pump, pumping energy into it? So what would happen if energy kept getting added to the train? So if this train is approaching the speed of light, what would happen to this energy that you kept adding to it? Well, you realize you can't go fast in the speed of light. So where does that energy go? Well, it goes into mass. So what we can say then is that basically mass and energy are like two sides of the same coin and that they can be uh, converted into each other. Which uh, I don't know why I'm writing this here because that is actually the, this question right here. So that's the next question. So what does it say about energy matter that they're really the same thing. They're just two sides of the same coin, kind of like electricity and magnetism. You can convert one to the other. Um, at the end of the video, they actually mentioned something interesting about the sun. They say that the sun loses about 4 million uh, tons of mass, just disappears. And that's obviously, just doesn't, does, I mean, gets converted into something. It's getting converted into energy, okay? Through, uh, you know, when fusion is happening in the sun, is, you know, energy is being converted into lots and lots of uh, energy. Okay. Um, so he publishes these five papers and what do you hear? Crickets, nothing until someone notices or someone not notices, but maybe steps up to the plate and says, listen, we need to, we need to notice this. This is, this kid's got something to say. It's important. We should recognize that it's important. We should take a look at this. So who was this person that gave Einstein his break? And again, very interesting character because we're going to talk about him in the next unit in quantum mechanics. Very, very important figure. Max Planck. Max Planck. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Max Planck. So he's the one who gave Einstein his, uh, his break. Okay. Then the video goes on to uh, talk about uh, lease. Is it Lisa or Lise? I think it's, I think it's Lise, isn't it? L-I-S-E. I think I have that incorrect. It should be Lise Minor. Can someone double check that for me? I think it's supposed to be Lise Minor. Uh, and Otto Hahn. 
Now, so I looked up their, their when they were born. So Meitner was born 1878, died 1968. Han was born 1879, died 1968. What's amazing is, <laughs> I mean, they were almost born at the same time, died at the same year. More amazing though is, okay, look at this. Lisa, is it Lisa or Lise? Did anyone check that out for me? I think it's Lise. Yeah, Lise. With an E, right? Yeah. Oh, geez. All right. Thank you. Um, she lived almost 90 years. And Han lived almost 90 years. And think about what they were working with. They were working with some, I would imagine, dangerous material. Right. And to to have lived that long, it's pretty, pretty fascinating when you think about it. Actually, I was doing a little bit of a digging about Han because it, in the video, you know, it comes across as a bit of a villain. And uh, I was I was interested to to know that he actually studied in McGill for a little while under uh, someone that you should be familiar with, Ernst Rutherford. All right. That's very, very interesting. OK. So first question, what was her understanding of the atom in the early 20th century? The answer is not much or very limited. In fact, it was at this time that said Rutherford was conducting, rather form, was conducting his um, gold foil experiments. And you remember um, what that revealed, right? That revealed that the nucleus is really, really tiny, but very dense, and the atom is mostly empty space. And you know, and then Bohr comes around explaining the distribution of electrons. So then, you know, early 20th century, people were starting just starting to unravel the the atom and its nature. Okay, next question was what was known of radioactive material? Well, what they knew was that it was unstable and that it leaked out radiation and uh, uh, now that means radiation in the form of like energy and particles okay and that's why to me that was very surprising there i mean they were playing meitner and han were playing with radioactive materials and they lived to you know to a very decent age um anyway okay so the 30s were the golden age of nuclear research uh what was the largest nuclei i know and how was meitner and han trying to make it bigger who wants to chime in i guess it was uranium okay. yes very good guess. It was uranium. And how they how would they make try to make it bigger? Do you remember? Fire neutrons into it. Yep. They were gonna to try to hit neutrons into the nucleus and make it stick. That was the goal. Okay, very good. All right. Now if you remember in the video, it's a bit of drama. Because in the 30s, the Nazis come to power. And that meant that the environment became very dangerous for Lise Meitner. Um, so she had to leave. Now in the video, so here, here's your opinion piece. Do you think Han tried to protect her do you think he did everything he could what do you think like what is your opinion of han based on what you saw in the video monica you always have something to say uh well i think i feel like he was just in there really like i think he was just really stuck because he wanted he did i think he there was like a threat that the whole like 
lab thing would be like shut down or something she didn't leave I don't know if that was a thing but like I feel like he didn't know which what to like prioritize like like either to like save her or or then like protect her or like to protect everyone else so I don't know I feel yeah. like he was just stuck but so yeah, I, I had no it's... opinion on him <laughs> okay no that is an opinion <laughs> that is okay, what do you yeah, mean that is an opinion well, <laughs> right you realize that he he was in a very very difficult situation that's an opinion of course it is uh anybody else have a a different opinion or because that i mean that, to me that's kind of the impression i got um that he was stuck i think so too um now did he do enough to protect her I don't know. I, I mean, we weren't there, so we don't know. It sounds to me like it was a very dangerous time, right? For those of you who know your history, you know, it was not exactly the safest place and time to be in. So um, do you think he tried to protect? I think he tried. I don't know if he tried his, as much as he could have, but I think he did try. Um, anyone disagree with that? Okay, so how about we just leave that as, we're not really sure. It looked like he kind of, I think he tried to help her. So she did have to leave. Uh, and when she left, she lost pretty much everything, right? We can just say pretty much everything except for her life, I guess, right? Um, she lost her pension. She lost her salary. She lost her books, her home. Uh, you know, that, I mean, that's... I mean, what more do you want? But that's, you know, that's, that's quite, quite significant. So she ends up going to Sweden. All right. There she meets up with her nephew, who is also a physicist, Otto Robert Frisch. Okay. And uh, she's still getting correspondence from Han. Now, uh, Han was getting some interesting results. Uh, what was unusual about his results? Remember what they were trying to do, right? They were trying to make a bigger nucleus. What was he getting instead? I guess you kind of gave it away. It was I like did. <laughs> <laughs> I did give it away. I'd be the worst game show host. Go ahead. <laughs> they were getting radium, which was actually like smaller. Yeah. Uh, it, and then, he, then they go on to say they, they were getting barium, right? Which yeah. is even smaller. So yeah, they were getting a uh, smaller nuclei, which, you know, it was very, very bizarre. But kind of like, we you know, with the Mickelson Morley experiment, what you think is a failure is not really a failure. It's just you got to interpret it differently now. So uh, what was the interpretation? So Meitner realized something when she pondered these results. Okay. Um, what she realized is that, well, the nuclei is unstable. That goes back to you know, the whole nature of radioactive material. And what actually happened is that the nuclei split when hit with a neutron uh, into smaller nuclei like uh, radium and barium. Now, what was really cool was uh, she was able to mathematically determine this because if you remember uh, her nephew says that the amount of energy um, that would be required to make the nuclei fall, fly apart is about 200 million uh, what's called electron volts and then she realizes that hmm you know the mass does not exactly add up to the mass of the original nuclei plus the neutron that would hit it. In fact, there's a little bit of missing mass. And that little bit of missing mass could account for the energy if we plug it into the E equals MC squared equation. So I actually did the calculation. Well, I'll just put it on, uh, on this side here. So just so you, I mean, we'll, deal with this more when we get to quantum mechanics but just so you know one electron volt is basically um, the charge of one electron 
times one volt, right? So which means if you remember, an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times a volt, which is a joule per coulomb. So an electron volt would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, joules. So 200 million electron volts would be simply 200 million times that value. So that would give you 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. So if you plug that value into E equals mc squared, then you get 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joules is equal to mc squared. And if you divide this by c squared, which is three times 10 to the eight squared, the amount of mass comes out to approximately 3.6 times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms. Um, a proton is about 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So that value is almost a fifth of the mass of a proton. Um, anyway, so if you realize that the missing mass would account for the energy required to make the nuclei fly apart, which is a, so when she realized this, she obviously, her and her nephew uh, published a paper uh, because what they were describing was actually something called uh, nuclear fission, okay? So let me skip over this for a second and then I just go back to this one. So um, this paper describing this process of the nuclei splitting up um, was very, very impactful in society. How did this change the world? I mean, think about this. This is like during World War II now, right? So how did this change the world? What did it lead to? The Anybody? atomic bomb. Yes. Yeah, it led to the atomic age, uh, the atomic bomb. If you remember, they talk about the Manhattan Project. That was the code name that the U.S. gave to the atomic bomb uh, development. I think the video that goes on to mention that she doesn't want to be part of that, but her nephew says, no, 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 what do you mean? We got, we got to develop this bomb. We got to beat the Nazis. Otherwise, if they get the bomb, then we're in big, big trouble. Okay. Uh, I skipped over the second last question. So in the video, they talk about, they kind of paint Han as a villain. Now, I'm not, I, I, so I looked up Han. I was like, hey, let me look up, you know, because this is what, since this is what you see in the video, what you see in real life. So it does sound like he did screw over. When he actually had his Nobel Prize speech, he doesn't really mention her. He mentions her very, very little, which I think, you know, uh, that's not cool, right? Obviously, I mean, without her, he would have never figured nuclear fission out what was going on with his results let me look up his credentials now this is from wikipedia uh, and i was looking up other sites too so they seem to concur with this and it seemed like um if you scroll down to like his awards where is it let's just go down should have just hit the tab award awards and honors like can you see this like he, he has received numerous awards and acclamations uh, over the years. So I don't know if he's as, you know, cause the video kind of, if you just watch the video, you kind of think, oh my God, this guy's a villain and this and that. But if you look up his awards and things that he's been recognized for, lots of uh, peace uh, medals and stuff like that, I mean, Seems like he was actually a pretty decent guy, although I don't agree with what he did with Lee Minor. I think that was uh, not not that cool. Anyways, okay. So any questions? Um, oh wait, I didn't ask question. How do you think this happened? So he doesn't. Uh, oh, I did answer the question. He doesn't recognize her. So. I'm not really sure why he only got recognized for the award. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I have no idea. I was actually reading about like her. Yeah. 
and why she didn't get the Nobel Prize. And um, there was an article that was written by the Nobel Prize Committee on okay. why they didn't give her the Nobel Prize. What'd they say? They did say that it was like apparently a mistake now that they look back at it. But then at the time, the person who was reviewing um, her uh, work- The clerical error, right? Yes, they, they because um, Meitner didn't have like many papers on the subject. So that was like one of the contributing factors as well. Okay, okay. I, I vaguely recall reading something like that. Yes, 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 yes. Well, that, that sucks. <laughs> That's terrible. Thank you. Um, all right, let, let's stop recording and then I'll take any questions.